hunter should hunt beasts. Leave the hunting of hunters to me. Few hunters can resist the intoxication of the hunt. Look at you. Just the same as all the rest. The hunters must die. The nightmare must end. Only I can stop this madness. The beast cannot be stopped! What good hunters now? Enough of this terrible dream! Death to hunters! No more dreams for me. This is my last chance. Hello everyone, this is Aegon of Astora, and welcome back to Bloodborne Let's Talk Lore. This is episode 14, being recorded on Saturday the 31st of October, actually Halloween. So, happy Halloween everyone, and I hope that you are all having a fantastic day, whenever it is that you find yourself watching this. Uh, I wanted to begin by just briefly thanking each and every one of you for the incredibly kind and warm response to the previous episode, episode 13, which featured one uh, Redgrave. Uh, I'm sure Redgrave feels the same way in that given all like the just vast number of issues we encountered uh, over the course of recording that particular episode, that I'm sure Redgrave was similarly uncertain as to how it would turn out, what the final product would look like. Um, but as you all saw, and as many of you so kindly uh, pointed out in the comments section, that yeah, it wound up turning out quite well. So thank you kindly, um, each and every one of you. Um, there were a couple of things that came up in the comments section that normally I would leave for the last part of the episode for the Hunter's Dream segment, but uh, beginning first with uh, a comment from Pancakes. And I should state that uh, before I actually read out the comment that uh, this is not directed at any of you individually, uh, but rather that these comments for me uh, really served to served to get me thinking about several things, and they intersected in very interesting ways with that which I've been grappling with over the last week and a half or so in, uh, you know, outside of YouTube and Bloodborne and Dark Souls and all that stuff, but uh, I'll get to that in a minute. So, uh, these, these are comments that, uh, you know, I'm not criticizing, I'm not speaking ill or, you know, I'm not casting aspersions on the individuals who left these comments. It's just the content of the comments themselves, irrespective of the individuals who left them, uh, got me thinking about several things and uh, led me in uh, the second example to uh, decide that I needed to kind of get out in front of this and clarify a couple things. Uh, so beginning at first with Pancakes, who writes, uh, Yo, Aegon, great video as always. Well, thank you. And really cool guest appearance. You and Redgrave are the are two of the pillars of lore discussion, uh, especially on the subreddit. Uh, so I guess I would point out first that I, I tend to not be very active on the subreddit, mostly because most of my time, uh, especially these days, is spent writing. And so to that end, you know, I, I, I guess I'm... I get kind of not tired of writing because, again, that's what I do. It's what I love to do. It's what I'm very fortunate and very privileged to be able to do, uh, for well, for the time being, for a living, and hopefully uh, for the foreseeable future for a living as well. Uh, but 
yeah, so that's all Redgrave. But there was just, just this comment got me thinking about the idea of individuals being pillars of the community. And again, very grateful for the sentiment that Pink Hanks is clearly expressing here and how kind and humbled I felt at initially reading it. But I felt that at least from, I needed to give my perspective on not this, again, not this particular, you know, statement or assertion or, you know, expression of belief, but on the idea of, you know, an individual being the pillar of a community and not the other way around. And uh, as I mentioned, this is something that intersects in many ways with that which I've been struggling with. Uh, and I mean struggle in the best, most profound and wonderful type of way, in that, uh, as I've mentioned in several of the previous episodes, I'm currently undergoing preparation for my comprehensive examinations uh, as part of you know the penultimate step, I guess, uh, prior to my dissertation for completing my doctorate. And for those of you unfamiliar with the process, and I'm not going to go into too great depth about it because it was something I was unfamiliar with until it came time for me to actually, you know, start doing it. But it's not an exam in the sense that, you know, I'm studying and then I'm going to sit down at a desk and write, you know, regurgitate shit for an hour. That's thankfully, thank the great ones that that is not what is involved because uh, I would do terribly at that and I don't think there's really much value to be had in that and while to be sure there's lots of problems in how the comprehensives as I'm doing them are structured as well um, this the last week and a half um, I came into contact with a textbook that I've, I've or an, an, it's not a textbook but a book that I've heard much about and that I've had awareness of for quite some time but that I had not yet read myself. And uh, just to, I guess, uh, actually make the point that I was about to make before I got sidetracked a little bit, uh, the, prep, the, the process of preparing for the comprehensives is like 90% of the work involved. So to that end, it's really important that you keep up a good pace that I believe I've mentioned the pace being more or less a book a day for, uh, you know, over the course of about half a year because you need to read and understand and be able to uh, discuss in a three hour long oral examination 150 books. And so, of course, in that way, you're not actually speaking to the contents of an individual book, of, of many of the individual books and that you are more so just kind of mapping the field through and around and you know in between these different texts and their authors and what they signify in the field more generally. And there are a few exceptions to this and the book that I'm talking about is in many ways one of those exceptions because it's so critical to not only this you know very this very particular and in, in many ways es esoteric academic pursuit, but that it, in many ways really demonstrates for me how incredibly important not only education is, but pedagogy. So kind of the, the theory of learning. And I meant even, I meant before I started recording to actually uh, include in my notes that I have uh, to the left of me right here, the actual definition of pedagogy, because uh, it's not coming immediately to mind. But uh, pedagogy, you know, understood on a very superficial level is, you know, the th theories of learning, uh, the investigation of how it is that people learn in such a way that the results of said investigation will yield a manner of structuring education that you know achieves the best possible outcome whatever the outcome the desired outcome or stated outcome is and so the book that I'm talking about is so incredibly foundational in many ways to and I, I am getting to the point I promise but it, it's it's 
incredibly foundational to virtually any pedagogical text or you know theory or way of looking at the world that exists today and uh, I use that very broad language um, purposely because pedagogy isn't just for the classroom it, it, yes it, it is in many ways tied to education because education is in many ways tied to everything else in the world but pedagogy stretches beyond that and uh, the author I'm speaking of, uh, whose text uh, I'm describing, is uh, Paulo Freire. And I apologize for the anglicized pronunciation of his surname, because I've heard it pronounced uh, in its native tongue of uh, Portuguese, but you all know me well enough at this point to know that I'm awful, awful, just god-awful at pronunciation, uh, especially of, of non uh, non-Anglo names, I guess. And I'm, I'm particularly interested in hearing to what extent my Brazilian viewers, because I know I have a number of Brazilian viewers, but I'm very interested in hearing um, among them, I believe, a vicious hunter and a couple of others whose names I'm not going to mention because I'm less certain about whether they are, in fact, uh, from Brazil. Uh, but the person I'm talking about is Paulo Freire, who wrote in 1970 a book called Pedagogy of the Oppressed. And this is one of those books that, as I mentioned, I had previously heard lots about. I had seen excerpts of the book quoted at length in other texts. I had, you know, an understanding of his general importance in terms of theories of pedagogy and, and learning and how that ties into politics and resistance uh, in the context of neoliberalism and just capitalism more generally. Uh, but this past week, week and a half, okay, and, and remember that I'm only supposed to spend one freaking day, technically, per text on this list, and I've not been able to finish, like I've finished reading the, the book proper, but th it's this incredibly rare text which has forced me in a way that only one other text has in the past, and that is uh, Michel Foucault's uh, Discipline and Punish. It has really forced me to kind of reevaluate and, and reanalyze and reconsider so many aspects of my life. Um, and this comment from Pancakes, and I promised, as, as I promised, I am getting to the point. This comment from pa Pancakes really intersected in a wonderful way that kind of served as a eureka moment for me. Uh, this excerpt that I'm about to read from Pedagogy of the Oppressed. This is from the, I believe, the 30th anniversary edition on, uh, and the excerpt I'm reading is on page, from page 17. Quote, in order to understand the meaning of dialogical practice, we have to put aside the simplistic understanding of dialogue as a mere technique. Dialogue does not represent a somewhat false path that I attempt to elaborate on and realize in the sense of involving the ingenuity of the other. On the contrary, dialogue characterizes an epistemological relationship. Thus, in this sense, dialogue is a way of knowing and should never be viewed as a mere tactic to involve students in a particular task. We have to make this point very clear. I engage in dialogue not necessarily because I like the other person. I engage in dialogue because I recognize the social and not merely the individualistic character of the process of knowing. In this sense, dialogue presents itself as an indispensable component of the process of both learning and knowing. <sighs> Just wonderful. and. I know that the language isn't necessarily the most clear thing in the world, uh, for starters because it, it wasn't actually written originally in English, this is a translation uh, from Portuguese. But what this meant for me, like the, the, the reason why I found it so profound and the reason why I'm bringing this up at the very beginning of an episode at the risk of turning off 
many people who you know maybe aren't really interested at all in hearing this stuff is that it really captured for me that which I you know wouldn't have previously been able to articulate about why it is I do this series and why it is that I do it in the way in the in the fashion that I am that he says it, you know he engages in dialogue not necessarily because he likes the other person so I like all of you let me be <laughs> clear about that first um, but the approach that I've taken for this series is a very conscious approach in that as I've said numerous times but I haven't been able to articulate this clearly I am using this approach not because you know simply I want to in some superficial way show that I care about community um, not because you know I have a quotient that I knew I want you know I've, I've decided I need to meet of comments I discuss in every episode but because I cannot separate the social from the individual that my understanding of this game my appreciation for the lore has been multiplied tenfold fiftyfold whatever you really it's incalculable how much my appreciation for the lore of this game has been improved increased accentuated by the exchanges that I have with each of you, however indirect they may be in this particular format. And yeah, just I hope that this in some way makes sense and that you all see at least why I find this to be so profound, why I am at this very moment, at 5.52 in the morning on Saturday the 31st of October in an attempt to ensure that this episode is uploaded and published by Sunday or Monday, why I am... why I, at 5.53 in the morning, I have not yet slept. Let me be clear about that. I didn't wake up and at 5 a.m. and say, I'm going to record an episode today. This is me babbling in part because uh, I... You know, I've not slept in something like 20, 24 hours. So, <laughs> yeah, I've, I've, I've kind of, I believe I made my point, but I may have also lost it. But mostly just to, in response to what Pancake said, which again, I really appreciate the sentiment behind it. And the kindness and the, the appreciation for all that Redgrave and I went through to uh, put together that previous episode. But it really underscored for me the need, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the need for me to articulate how it is that I conceive of our relationship, of my relationship with each of you, and that it's not, it's not me propping you up, it's you propping me up. If you go, if, if you are feeling especially adventurous, and you are you have a very high, very high tolerance for low production value relative to this series then you might be interested in seeing the difference between uh, beyond the per difference in production value and my own kind of i guess experience doing live commentary you might be interested to see the difference between this series and Dark Souls 2 Let's Talk Lore, which um, was my very first playthrough ever, and a playthrough that was done at a time when uh, I had something like three people who actually, you know, watched some portion of the series. I had one person, I believe, who commented throughout. Uh, AJ Sin, who I've mentioned in a previous episode as, as one of my oldest viewers, and as AJ Sin pointed out, uh, that term apparently applies no matter uh, what you mean by oldest viewers. Uh, it was just AJ Sin who commented on a few of the videos, and the difference is palpable for me. If you can get beyond the difference in terms of the, the production values, it's, it's not the same if it's just me playing the game and, you know, talking about things of my own accord. The process, the, the 
dialogue that you and I have, again, however indirect, and I recognize, and we'll get to that in just a second, how imperfect this form of dialogue is, but the fact that you have all, you all commit so much time, energy, and effort every single, I was going to say every single week, every second week that I publish an, a, a video that so many of you write what essentially amount to essays, um, sharing your thoughts and providing insights that I could not have in a million years come up with on my own. Uh, just know that I appreciate that very much and that for whatever it's worth, you can view me as a pillar of the community if you want, but for, for what it's worth, that's a characterization that I, know, I not only think is not really accurate, but that just for me, I, I reject. Because as far as I'm concerned, if in fact there are pillars to the community, uh, then the pillars would have to be each of you and not me. Um, that, you know, I, again, while I'm extremely appreciative of the sentiment behind that notion, uh, I think it's backwards. So the second comment I wanted to discuss was uh, from Regal Eagle, who writes, you should have a fan-based episode. Uh, bring on some fans to discuss a topic. I would love to cover this game with you. I think it would be fun. And so this is something that uh, I've, I've thought about a great deal even prior to having Redgrave on the show. Uh, I've, I've toyed around with the idea of doing a live recording of Bloodborne Let's Talk Lore. And in a sense, that's kind of how the previous ended episode uh, ended up. Although, you know, it wasn't really a live recording in the sense of, you know, it, there was no participation beyond anyone but Redgrave. And even in that really imperfect that really imperfect potential way of doing it. Uh, it. It would be wonderful, but there are so many logistical issues involved that I would need to somehow address before that can actually be a thing. Um, the first, which I'm not even sure if it's possible for me to address, would be the lag, the delay, between uh, what's actually happening on my screen and that which everyone else uh, sees on stream. And that raises a whole series of issues in terms of, you know, the flow of the episode and my ability to actually remain on track and, uh, you know, see a thread through from beginning to end because um, that's something I struggle with generally. And if you've ever seen any of my live streams, you see that, you know, very often I find myself starting one discussion point and then as soon as someone else brings something else up in chat uh, again because again dialogue is very important to me I immediately shift focus to whatever it is that's just been said and so beyond that there's also the issue of the the quality of the recording and while this wasn't an issue in the previous episode it would be I think an issue for anyone watching on the stream because if I'm recording a episode of Bloodborne Let's Talk Lore I'm doing it with my CAD U37 my microphone plugged into my laptop and with the uh, PlayStation camera serving as the mic because I can't have my microphone both recording into Audacity on my laptop and plugged into my PS4. And when I stream, I generally have my mic plugged into my PS4, which means that I can't record on my laptop. So uh, it would severely compromise the quality of the, the commentary. And beyond that, just it, it would kind of be really just imperfect in so many ways that such that I think if I am going to really try and do a community focus episode, whereas uh, Regal Eagle suggested that I have several people on in a single episode, it would need to be done right. And as far as having other people on in a similar way to how I had Redgrave on, 
uh, just I'll, I'll put up an image on the screen right now that I sent Redgrave. This was the week before we, we were actually able to record, but the setup was virtually the same of just the disaster that was my uh, desk when I was attempting to figure out how exactly all of this was going to work. And you know, you can see that uh, my laptop resting on my gar on a garbage can plugged it with my mic plugged into the laptop, but also the, the headphones draped over the, the uh, microphone itself. The headphones which are in turn plugged into the back of my television and you can see to the right of my mic it's it's kind of hard to see because it's black like my desk is the PlayStation camera which is the microphone from which Redgrave is hearing me and I'm hearing Redgrave's I was hearing Redgrave's uh, mic through my headphones which were plugged into the TV which had a really loud hiss in the background, making it incredibly difficult to hear something like 25% of the things that Redgrave actually said. And I was, you know, really embarrassed when I went back and I actually looked at the, uh, when I actually looked at, or uh, watched the episode all over again and saw just how many things that Redgrave said that just kind of totally flew over my head. Um, due in part to the fact that I just could barely hear him through no fault of his own through the feedback issue but and again I'm recording this it's now 6.02 a.m. I've been talking for almost half an hour already and we've not moved from Udin Chapel so I apologize about that but uh, just if this were something that I was doing kind of as a full-time thing if this were still a summer even uh that's certainly something I would do my best to put together, to have an episode where I have several people on. Um, but as it stands right now, this is something that I'm doing, again, at 6 in the morning when I should have been asleep three hours ago. And in such a way that, yeah, I, I have kind of... I'm not being smart. Let me just say that I'm not. I'm not being smart in how it is that I'm taking care of myself, in some ways, and. But at the same, like I don't regret that at all. I'm not complaining. I'm just trying to provide everyone, who you know maybe felt similar or or you know had a similar idea because I did receive a couple of private messages to that effect as well, that I would love. I would. I would love nothing more than to have you know, a whole number of people on the show in the same way that I had Redgrave on last week. But as you can see from that image that I just showed, uh, it, it was a huge amount of work. And as I tried to convey in the introduction to the previous episode, uh, the sheer amount of effort involved in putting that episode together is not something that I have the time, the ability, or the patience to really do. Uh, any more than you know I already have so again because as I've just said dialogue is crucially important to this playthrough to my understanding of the game to my my conception of education and life and democracy and all these things uh, I am doing my best and it pains me to say that that's not something that's not a suggestion that I'll, I'll be able to at least for now, uh, make happen. But just know that, again, based on everything I've said, that it's something that I regret, but that I'm, I just am trying to be realistic and to not completely allow my body to fall apart on the basis of all these things that I'm interested in but that I and that I'm passionate about, but that I don't necessarily have the time uh, or the energy to do. So with all that said, uh, something else briefly before we move on is that the expansion to Bloodborne, the Old Hunters, was I believe today or yesterday at some point, uh, was actually um, put up on the PlayStation Store for pre-order so that you could preload the DLC prior to its 
uh, midnight release on, I believe, the 24th of November. And so though the timer you're seeing on screen right now is not accurate because it's it was the timer that I recorded a couple hours prior to actually having started recording this episode, um, yeah, we are getting closer, finally, to the expansion. And uh, I just wanted to point out that, yeah, if that's something you're interested in, because, you know, even with FromSoft, I, I'm very hesitant to encourage anyone to pre-order, so I'm not going to do that. But I will say that uh, if that is something, if you want to play right at midnight, uh, you can pre-order it. And as I understand it, that will allow you to, you know, download it a couple days before. So then that way, right at midnight, you can dive right into it. If that's not something you're going to do, as I, I mentioned either in the previous episode or the episode prior to that, I am going to do a live stream of the of my blind playthrough of the DLC. Um, as soon as it's in, as soon as it's available, and uh, provided that nothing crazy comes up in the meantime, because sandwiched around the release of the DLC itself are several important commitments that I have conference presentation I'm chairing a uh, session at another conference and uh, I'm teaching uh, I believe two days after the DLC is released so ideally what I would love to do is midnight on the day of release live stream on Twitch from beginning to end my blind playthrough of the DLC so that's the plan whether or not I'll actually be able to play through the entirety of the, the new content in a single live stream remains to be seen. But certainly, as soon as I'm able to, uh, you can be sure that, yeah, I will be live streaming that on Twitch. So if that's something that interests you, then you will find a link in the video description below to my Twitch page, which you can, uh, you can follow me there and... Ideally, it will uh, notify you when I am live, and you can come join us. If, again, you are not married to the idea of going through the new content blind on your own, because I know that that's something that many people, myself included, of course, uh, are very much looking forward to doing. And so I, uh, there will be no hard feelings if you are not among those who join me on the live stream. We've not seen Eileen in quite some time. In fact, since uh, we helped her and she helped us take out Henrik. And we find her here lying in a what appears very much to be a pool of her own blood, writhing in pain. And recall that when we fought Henrik alongside Eileen, that by the end of the fight, she was out of breath, she was panting, and it took her a while to actually say what she wanted to say because, yeah, she was not in fantastic shape after the fight. In spite of the fact that, yeah, we were helping her. So, as was suggested by, as was implied by all of that, uh, she seems to be well past her prime. That she's been doing this for quite some time. And something appears to have gotten the better of her. And that something is this guy right here. Who we are going to be talking about in just one minute.
But first, let's see how Eileen's doing. Oh. Is that you again? I'm afraid I've made a bit of a blunder. I'm just going to have a short rest. Though, don't worry. I've taken blood. Enough to save an old woman. No more dreams for me. This is my last chance. What a fool I am. I'll have to tread carefully. But that thing still lies in wait. Turn back. This is my score to settle. So there's several very, very important things that she said there. Uh, perhaps most important among them is no more dreams for me. This is my last chance. Confirming that Eileen is, or was, in fact, at one point, a pale blood hunter. And, uh, you know, I've heard people try to explain this away in, in the strangest, oddest ways. But, really, no more dreams for me. This is my last chance. While she's lying in a pool of her own blood, discussing the seeming, you know, the, the incredibly grim situation that she currently finds herself in, where that thing, as she said, still lies in wait. And as we'll see, and anyone who's ever tried to fight that thing uh, knows that that thing is incredibly, incredibly overpowered. So even if you, even if Eileen was at her full strength, even if she was in her prime, she might still have been bested by that thing. And yeah, uh, well, we're going to have a lot more to discuss here with respect to Eileen, but for now, just take note of how incredibly significant that is. That she, like us, was once a pale blood hunter. And that she chose to be severed by the dream. She submitted to Garman. And much like Jura, after having done so, she continued to try to affect the world in some in some way I was going to say in some small way but from, from her perspective like the thing she's doing uh, as a hunter of hunters is a rather significant job it's a rather substantial burden as she will let us know later and yeah it's, it's really really interesting because in the context of the Souls games, and this is a comparison I've made before, but there there's a huge difference between being a pale blood hunter in Bloodborne and being just an undead in the Souls games. To be a pale blood hunter is to be extraordinarily special in some ways, whereas in Dark Souls, every single human is undead. But not every hunter is a pilbot hunter. And she once was. And yet she persists here in the world. But by virtue of the fact that she no longer dreams, she is now faced she has now come face to face with her mortality. For the first time since becoming a pilbot hunter for the first time. She has been effectively immortal up until now. Well, uh, effectively up until the point when she was severed from the dream, but after we helped her, when we helped her with Henrik, that was, would have been the closest she had come to a brush with mortality, but, yep, she's, you know, kind of starting to realize, and maybe that's what she was referring to when she described, she said, what a fool I am. She may have been referring to her attempt at 
taking this thing out. Or she could have been thinking even further back because, you know, of course, when you're in a situation like that, when you are faced with your own mortality, I, I can think of no other thing to occupy your mind with than regrets, loved ones, things like that, but uh, she doesn't really seem to have, she seems to keep people at a distance as she has been trying very hard to do with us, telling us that even though she's lying in a pool of her own blood, that she, she did this to us, even though it didn't actually show it to us, but oh, I don't want to get rid of that one. She maintained her sassiness, I guess, and and her stubbornness, certainly, in trying to tell us, no, no, I'll be fine, I'm just having a short rest, and then I'm going to go right back at it. So she could have been referring to the fact that, yeah, she was stupid in trying to take on this thing, uh, in spite of how far, how, how much of a decline she seems to have uh endure you know she how far she's fallen from her prime or she could have maybe been thinking further back about her decision to become severed from the dream i don't know but if she had fulfilled her contract uh i suppose the way garman presents it is that she doesn't really have any other choice and another thing I meant to do before I started recording was to actually listen back to the intro that I made, which, if you've seen my cinematic lore video on uh, Eileen the Crow, you'll you will likely have recognized that immediately as as uh, an excerpt from that, uh, adapted of course for this particular episode, uh, where yeah she talks about the hunt and about hunters, and how the beast cannot be stopped. She seems to have this view of the hunt, this very cynical view of the hunt, much like Jura, of what is the fucking point. Pardon my French, but that, that seems to be the overwhelming, that's the overwhelming sentiment I, I've sensed from the two of them, that they seem to have in some way, shape, or form recognized the extent to which their individual actions, while in her case, sure, significant in some ways, as I suggested uh, a, a couple minutes ago, that by, you know, taking care of blood adult hunters, she can, in some small way, affect positive change on the world. But at the same time, she... The Pale Blood Hunter, especially, is, in my view, little more than a pawn in a great one game that our puny little human minds can hardly even comprehend the significance or the purpose of it. And so she aptly points out, in, in how I've depicted it, she aptly points out to the bloody crow of Canehurst, this thing, what is the point? The beast cannot be stopped. So what good are hunters now? They're really not. They're really no good as far as the well-being of the Yarnamites, the people of Yarnum, are concerned. Uh, but yeah. The Bloody Crow of Canehurst. And you can see... The point at which the physics on <laughs> the crow feather garb kicks in, which always kind of, yeah, leaves me taken aback a little bit. So before we actually engage with this incredibly overpowered enemy, excuse me, I did want to draw briefly on what I believe was the first kind of theorizing 
uh, publicly, or the first theory that Redgrave shared publicly with the Bloodborne subreddit. And it did, of course, have to do with this guy. So the post was titled, uh, the, this is going to be another word, it was pronunciation I butcher, the Chikaj, Chikaje Hunter's Identity. So we'll just call him the Bloody Crow of, of Canehurst. I'm not sure if that's actually the canonical name, uh, but that's what I'm going to go with for now. Uh, so he says, uh, Redgrave writes, and, and these, this is, these are selected excerpts from the larger post, which I'm obviously, as usual, not going to recapitulate in full. Uh, so Redgrave writes in part, quote, for starters, let's take a very basic look at the Chicago, Chicago, at the, <laughs> at the Canehurst Hunter, the bloody crow of Canehurst Hunter's equipment. He wears a Canehurst helmet, wields a Chikage, and throws numbing mist at the pale butt hunter, at the player character hunter. All three of these point towards the bloody crow of Canehurst having strong ties to Queen Annalise and the Vilebloods. All three of these items indicate the Chikage hunter's hunter has very strong ties to Annalise and the Vilebloods, leading many players to naturally associate him as being a Vileblood. However, this doesn't exactly make sense, seeing as Queen Annalise, if the player character swears an oath to her, explicitly states that she and the player character are, quote, the very last on this earth, end quote. This means one of two things. Either this thing, we'll just go with that for now on, either this thing is not a vile blood, or Queen Annalise is unaware of his existence. Seeing as I find the latter unlikely, I believe that this thing is definitely not a vile blood. Let's take a look at the rest of his equipment for more clues on his identity. Weirdly enough, he actually uses a repeating pistol as his firearm, not an Evelyn as one would expect a Canehurst Knight to wield. The item's description state that it's a repeating pistol typically used by healing church hunters. Bizarrely enough, this links this thing as having ties to two different and violently opposing fas uh, factions, the Valbloods and the healing church. But even more strange is the fact that he appears to wear crow feather garb as his torso attire. He is the only NPC we encounter other than Eileen who wears this. But most, most importantly, the this thing is one of two enemies we fight who makes use of the ancient uh, hunting art of quickening. One is Garman who, who uses it uh, in your fight against him, and this thing is the other, who uses a noticeably weaker version. So Redgrave goes on in this very early uh, post. I don't have, I probably should have made note of when exactly this was uh posted, but I believe it was not long after the game game's initial release. And uh, Redgrave, who, as, as we uh, discussed in the previous episode, uh, much like myself, likes to be wrong, because it shows, once again, the, this, the power of dialogue. That dialogue is not just a method, it's not just a thing to be done, that we learn by being wrong by learning better, more insightful ways of seeing things from other people that uh, would otherwise have been inaccessible to us. And so he goes on to basically argue that this thing uh, is Lawrence. And as, as we've discussed in terms of uh, Lawrence in past episodes, uh, this is obviously not something that Redgrave uh, maintained over time that he came to a different view on Lawrence uh, but I still I, I I've heard many theories about this guy and what he is where he's from what his significance is if in fact there is any significance to him at all because he uh, as Redgrave so aptly points out and I was reading all of this out just because in part because I'm tired, but also because Redgrave does such an excellent job of articulating how this this thing is somewhat of a patchwork 
hunter that maybe those were all just trinkets that he's accumulated from his victims. Maybe maybe Eileen used to have a partner whom or maybe this was once a partner of Eileen, but I, I think it's probably more likely that he just, you know, killed all of these different hunters and wears their gear because he likes it. Maybe this is just a fourth wall breaking reference to, you know, f the idea of fashion souls and how players mix and match pieces of equipment with little regard to what that means in terms of the lore of the game, as is that right, of course, and as is, as you see with my, <laughs> with my build, I, I think Fashion Souls is a very important consideration, but, but yeah, I, I'm mostly just laying all this out because I'm very interested in hearing what each of you think, as always. A hunter, are you? And an outsider? Prepare yourself for the worst. There are no humans left. They're all flesh-hungry beasts now. <sighs> no more dreams for me. This is my last chance. <sighs> oh. Is that you again? I'm afraid I've made a bit of a blunder. Blood Rapture.
a carol rune that transcribes in human sounds. Blood Rapture is the raw euphoria of the warmth of blood. Restores HP with visceral attacks, one of the darker hunter techniques. This rune resonates with servants of the queen, carrier of the child of blood, who yearn for their queen's blood with little hope of requitement. For them, they find solace in blood rapture that serves as a surrogate for their desires. So, unless I'm completely misremembering this, that is the exact same rune that we picked up, and we do in fact have two of them. That is the second one that we've picked up. That is the exact same rune dropped by the Shadows of Yarnum. So while we might, given all of his, and so again, maybe this is all just misdirection by FromSoft, uh, in a way that, for whatever reason, serves that maybe they wanted to troll people trying to figure out the lore on this particular enemy. Because he's just this patchwork mosaic of all of these different these different factions and different allegiances in the game world. Because even though if you're looking at this just, you know, on a surface, on a superficial level, you think, okay, Queen is is clearly a reference to Annalise, Queen of the Vile Bloods. Because after all, he's wearing, you know, he has other Vile Blood stuff. He is using, uh, the Chikage, however it's pronounced, and he has, you know, uh, vile blood gear on. But this is the same rune, again, that is dropped by the Shadows of Yarnum, which suggests, implies rather strongly that he is also in some way tied to Yarnum, the Thumerian Queen. So, I don't know. I have no idea. <laughs> um, but I'm hoping that and anticipating, given uh, what I've seen in the aftermath of the previous 13 episodes, anticipating that one or many of you will have a very good or compelling or interesting idea as to the significance of that. Don't you ever listen to your elders. No matter. You did save my life. I don't seem to be apt for this life anymore. My glory days were long ago now. Hmm. I know. Here. For you. This too is Hunter's work, but it bears no honor, a burden you may choose to carry. The decision is yours alone. Oh. My eyes grow heavy. Let me rest a while. I'll be fine. Just. Wait. Okay, before we leave her to rest a while, it occurred to me that I have not yet captured the thumbnail for this episode. Recall again uh, the intro that I put together, and that that is by no means a canonical way of looking at it. But what I've done there is I've taken the dialogue that, uh, if for example you do a significant amount of damage to her during the Henrik encounter, 
then rather than coming here and finding her in this position, finding her like this, you actually find her in the cathedral waiting for you. So that's how it is that I went about capturing that particular scene, was that, uh, oh, well, I guess that's a whole other thing. I, I'm even confusing myself thinking about, because I remember her episode of the, or, you know, the video that I did for her for the cinematic lore uh, was incredibly, incredibly complex and took a very long time. Several different new game cycles before I knew how to back up saves and restore them, which would have been really, really useful back then, but uh, I had no idea how any of that was supposed to work back then. So uh, I had to go through several different new game cycles and capturing the dialogue. This was before Moonlight Butterfly had uploaded all of it very helpfully to his channel. But she, you know, went from the perspective while in my depiction of it she was fighting the bloody crow of Kanehurst where you know she was saying that there's no use for hunters anymore that she had in many ways lost all faith any faith that she once had um, in the hunt in her fellow hunters all hunters must die I believe is is the phrase she says. It's really quite shocking if you've never actually gotten that dialogue from her. How just enraged she is. That it's almost maniacal, the tone of her voice. And completely out of line with just about how the rest of every other line of her dialogue, which is very calm, very cool, collected. Even when she's sitting here dying, she still has that kind of swagger, I guess. That, that yeah, I'm dying but I'm I'm good just leave me alone you know I'm I can handle it uh, but in a very you know wonderful I guess in a very very wonderful twist in that story of her having completely lost faith in hunters the player character hunter comes along and in some small way it seems like that faith that she had or may have had, or may never have had, that we restored it or built it for her. That she realizes there are other hunters out there who, you know, say what you will about the hunters of hunters, and we'll talk about that once we get back to the hunter's dream when we read all of the item descriptions, but she is, again, another one of those characters that does seem from her own perspective, to be trying to affect positive change in this awful world that she finds herself in. She says, enough of this terrible dream. Death to hunters. And then, yeah, we come along and she's like, okay, maybe there is someone who can carry the torch, so to speak. Turn here. Um, in fact, yeah, we will return here before this episode is over and talk about her fate. I am very tired.
So I have no idea what the trigger is for that. And I couldn't hear exactly what the sound was that was being made. Uh, because I'm playing with my volume very low so that it doesn't come through in the mic. Uh, but if I heard what I thought I did, it sounded a lot like someone snoring. Presumably Garman snoring. Uh, but I will, of course, uh, increase the volume so that you can hear uh, what we may or may not just have heard more clearly. Uh, so I was not at all embellishing when I said I was really tired before the warp just now. And I say that because it is now actually, uh, this is now actually being recorded on Sunday the 1st of November at around 6 p.m. Uh, immediately after I warped back to the Hunter's Dream, I just turned off, like, I faded really fast. When I first started recording, I wasn't, I didn't feel too tired. I felt like I could get my way through an entire episode okay, but that was clearly not the case. Uh, as after I actually um, started fighting the Bloody Crow of Canehurst, and I did look it up on, in the guide, it does in fact refer to that enemy as the Bloody Crow of Canehurst. I wasn't sure if that was in any way an official name uh, previously. Uh, but yeah, I, it was at that point I started feeling incredibly tired, and by the time I warped back to the Hunter's Dream, I realized I need to go sleep because I am falling asleep here while recording and that's never happened before so I thought about editing out parts of that or doing post commentary but uh, beyond not really having the time to do that I figure it's, it's important for all of you just based in part on what I was saying earlier it's important to know the the space that the person is coming from when you know they're saying or trying to communicate something and so that's the space I was in uh, when I went on and on and on for about half an hour about uh, Paula Freire and dialogue. And the point I was trying to make essentially was that, uh, you know, I, I see no other way of doing lore in a Souls game. I see no better way, certainly, uh, that isn't centered exclusively around dialogue. Uh, I, I don't. I don't really think there's much legitimacy to the idea of one person, you know, claiming to have understood the lore and then just making a video uh, saying, this is the story explained, and then not actually, like that part of it is fine, sure, go ahead, but uh, the, the crucial component of that, that adds legitimacy in my view, is the dialogue that follows and that leads into that, those uh, types of projects. Uh, but with all of that said, we have some item descriptions to read, uh, and since it is now about like 24, 30 hours since I recorded the last one, uh, I should hopefully be in a much better place and much, much more capable of uh, actually speaking to the significance of these items. And and that's precisely why I didn't actually read any of them uh, when we first got them because I yeah, like I said, I was fading really fast at that point. So, Hunter. A carol rune that transcribes in human sounds. The This red smudged rune means hunter, and has been adopted by those who have taken on the hunter of hunter's oath. These watchmen, uh, and women uh, evidently, admonish those who have become addled with blood, be they be men or beasts. Anyone who has threatened the pledgers of the, the hunter oath surely has an issue with blood. Anyone who has threatened the pledgers of the Hunter Oath surely has an issue with blood. I'm not really sure what to make of that last sentence, to be perfectly honest, even in my now uh, lucid state. Um, but very interesting nevertheless. Let's see how it compares to Dangling upside down rune etched in one's mind, symbol of a hunter, by focusing one. Okay, so. Very, very interesting. Oh, and then what was the other thing she dropped for us was a badge. Which. Badge of a hunter of hunters who hunts those who have become addled with blood. The badge of the hunter of hunters is quietly passed down from generation to generation. 
usually to an outsider from the hinterlands. To be entrusted with this cursed badge, one must be strong, resilient to the seduction of blood, and gracious when taking a comrade's life. So the idea of the hinterlands is something that we'll talk about in just a little bit, uh, mostly because <laughs> Here too is another thing I forgot to add to my notes. I really need to spend more time actually looking over my notes to make sure that I've put everything down. But as I understand it, the hinterlands is kind of a general way of, of referring to someone who is just from somewhere far away, a place that is inaccessible to uh, most people. But I might be completely misremembering that, so I'll have to actually look up what the definition says before I speak to that further. So with that badge, um, okay, with that badge, I thought we would be able to buy, although I guess since Eileen's not an enemy, her armor actually shows up here. Yeah, okay. Um, I don't know if that's actually the distinction that's being made there, um, but it's, it's an interesting one. Okay, wood carved mask of Eileen the Crow, hunter of hunters. The beak contains incense to mask scents of blood and beast. Hunters of hunters dress as crows to suggest sky burial. The first hunter of hunters came from a foreign land and gave the dead a virtuous native funeral ritual, rather than impose a blasphemous Yarnum burial service upon them, with the hope that former compatriots might be returned to the skies and find rest in a hunter's dream. This one just says known in particular for her crow feather cape. Okay, so we're going to have to pop some souls in order to be able to afford this because I assumed that it was merely a uh, that we would be purchasing her gear from the insight shop. But evidently, I was mistaken. I'm not sure if we'll actually be wearing it, but I, it'd be good to have everything we need on hand so that if we ever need to look up an item description, all we need to do is actually just open up our inventory. Uh, we do need some more bone marrow ash as well. Although, as you can see, we're almost completely maxed out, so I could have just gone to my storage and grabbed it from there. Uh, and the reason why I'm doing all this now is simply that we have another brief stop to make before we get to the comments, of which there are plenty that I want to talk about this week, so I'm not sure if we will, in fact, get to all of them. And of course, and also since it's been a while since I've actually been in the Hunter's Dream uh, outside of the context of the comments, uh, just a couple things that are worthy of note. The first being that this headstone is referred to as the Yarnum headstone. This one is the Frontier headstone. This one is the Unseen headstone. And this one is the Nightmare headstone. And in every single case, you'll note that at the top of the dialogue box that pops up, all of them say, Awaken Above Ground. Just verifying that, yeah, every single one of them says Awaken Above Ground. You will also note that even though the music has been the same since we reached the last Insight Breakpoint, which I believe was 90, uh, at 90 Insight, the music in the Hunter's Dream changes to this song, the Moonlit, moonlit Melody, uh, regardless of whether or not you have actually um, uncovered the ritual secret if you have killed Rom. And previous, previous to actually killing Rom, regardless of your insight, if you look up at the sky, it, you know, it's, it's fairly cloudy, but they're just white clouds. And so it seems almost as though these pillars are all holding up the world, kind of like you know, the, the idea of a world tree. But after the blood moon rises, the, the hunter's dream changes, and you can see that it doesn't really, that doesn't really seem to be the case. 
And I believe this is something that I uh, suggested might be a possibility previously, so I won't go into it in great detail. But something I've speculated about is whether or not all of these kind of towers over here are maybe other iterations of the Hunter's Dream. That we are on top of one of these pillars. That if you were standing in that pillar, in the Hunter's Dream that is that pillar, and you looked over here, you would see basically what we're looking at when we see, or what we see when we're looking at one of these pillars. And I don't know whether that has any story significance or whether it's just a really clever way of communicating that even though as a Pillbutt Hunter in many ways you are special, uh, that there you do exist, that your universe is part of a multiverse, that you are just one of many Pillbutt Hunters, and that, yeah, there exist countless others who also have their own iteration of the Hunter's Dream. And yeah, really... It, beyond kind of the graphical limitations here, it does look like these kind of extend forever. That there is an, there are an infinite number of these pillars. But I could be completely off base about that, but as always, I'm very interested in hearing what each of you think about it. So we are cursed in a sense right now by, we're cursed by choice uh, in the sense that we have so many potential paths before us now that we've finally broken the ritual secret. And I promise when we actually do this area, we are not simply going to run by everything. But I do want to get the key to the upper cathedral ward. So that's what we're going to do. So this is about as far as we're going to go into Yahargul for now. Uh, because we came here for this. So we see a... The corpse of... A choir member. Based on their attire. And indeed holding a key to the upper cathedral ward. The key to the upper cathedral ward seal. The upper echelons of the healing church are formed by the school of Mensis, based in the unseen village, and the choir, occupying the upper cathedral ward. This key brings one a step closer to the choir. So, this person was being kept in this cage. Suggesting perhaps that there was a secondary schism or a rift that existed between the upper, the, the two factions of the upper echelons of the Cathedral Ward. And you'll recall that we, uh, several episode, episodes ago, made this, uh, this chart here showing how the healing church is organized and how it came to be and it's just very very intriguing that this person was seemingly being held here being tortured maybe by members of the school of mensis who were hoping to get this individual to divulge secrets perhaps about the choir and their activities i don't really know 
but it's something that we should keep in mind uh, for the next episode, which I I think at this point, yeah, the, the Upper Cathedral Ward is probably the next logical step in our journey. Okay, so as usual, there were a lot of very uh, insightful comments, and we're not going to be able to get to them all today, but uh, I'm just going to get started so that we can cover as many as possible. Beginning first with Dima Parachute, who writes, Do you think the skeletons on the wall and the gravestones show how committed people were? If I remember correctly, the Great Wall of China was built in a similar fashion. People died right there at the wall and were buried there. They couldn't afford to spend any resources or time to conduct proper burial procedures. So the Bergenworth College, as you guys said, wasn't sadistic, but perhaps they were very dedicated to their cause. And yeah, in response to that, I don't really have much more to add beyond that which I replied to Demon Parachute in the comments um, to say that it certainly wouldn't be the first time in a Souls game that human welfare was subordinated to the pursuit of knowledge. And I'm thinking specifically of uh, the case of Seath the Scaleless and the Duke's Archive, uh, the Duke's Archives, and uh, the whole Logan storyline. Which, if you're following my Dark Souls uh, casual playthrough, that's something that we've been talking about, or that we talked about a lot in the previous episode. And uh, whenever the time comes for us to um, record and, and finish up the next episode. That's something we'll talk about a great deal there as well. But yeah, this would seem to make sense uh, within that context. We got a comment from Vicar Amelia uh, herself, uh, who pointed out um, that Kanehurst, uh, in Kanehurst, the blood moon never rises. Uh, great video, guys. Please keep them coming. Uh, I will certainly do my best to keep them coming and hopefully they will continue to be great videos, but thank you for pointing that out. So, Bergenworth and Kanehurst, uh, two places that very interestingly, there's no blood moon. Next uh, is Jippowap47, who writes, the doll is quite old. Uh, building on a comment from the previous episode, that explains the slightly odd proportions. She's a head taller than us, tapering at the upper body. It's not just that she has a Victorian standard of beauty, she might be a product of the Thumerians. Going off the deep end here, she might contain the essence of a Thumerian in reduced form. She can alter us in the way her makers altered the world, and can feel emotions if pressed hard enough, like a pale reflection of their greatness. Also explains how the sinister bell ringers got their bells, they always had them. If they are dolls, that is. A bit irrelevant, Thumeria is an interesting world. It's got the thonic sounding beginning and ends in Sumeria, uh, the Ur example of civilization. So very interesting. Thank you for sharing that, Chippewa47. I cer certainly wouldn't put it past the doll, uh, or put it past FromSoft, I guess, to make the doll a product of uh, a doll that contains the essence of a Thumerian. And she, cer they certainly share the same pale complexion, so that's an, yeah, very interesting. Uh, Brian Smith writes, uh, I think the thing about Bergenworth isn't that we don't get the answers we expect. I see it as the point where we learn we have been asking the wrong questions the entire time. That is an excellent way of articulating it. Uh, because... It really doesn't matter what answers you find, of course, if you're looking, if you're asking the wrong questions. So that is an excellent and, and really uh, apt way of putting it. I imagine part of the problems in the game's plot is that the sympathetic great ones can mean well, but uh, are so alien they cannot help humanity. Just as humanity cannot fully understand them, they in turn cannot understand humanity. But this forces the issue of what exactly are the real great ones. Maybe this is just wrong, but I'm wondering if the doll is a representation of a great one. We see images of her, maybe, in the Chalice Dungeons. We see the doll in the Waking World, perhaps trying to move, but unable to do so. Only having uh, scraped against the cosmos can we see her move in the dream. 
So if she is a great one, maybe the body we see is a great one projecting an avatar into this world. Her and her messengers. Perhaps the Winter Lanterns are a version of this symbol being corrupted by the Nightmare. The seeing and the sight of them induce frenzy as we are being forced to parse the disrupted signal. Very interesting way of putting it. Uh, and I guess I'll read the rest of the comment before I respond, but uh, my other thought regarding the Great Ones uh, is about the false gods, the amygdala. This relates more to the last video. It made me think of Gnosticism. Perhaps the church is worshipping beings that aren't actually Great Ones. They are pretenders, much like the demiurge of Gnostic myth. That being a uh, that being is a false god that tries to act out uh, act as a god out of a selfish desire. It solves the problem of evil by suggesting that there is still an all-powerful and all-loving god, but a lesser and not benevolent, uh, or perhaps just incompetent, is the creator. So why? So it is why the amygdala seem more malevolent. They don't seem sympathetic at all to humanity. The daughter of the cosmos isn't hostile at all until attacked. Uh, the same with Rom, though she is ascended kin. And Murgo's wet nurse is defending an infant. Amygdala just attack because they can, and they do bleed red. Speaking of Rom, she is a spider, and the Garden of Eyes puts a stone with a spider on it next to our head. Is that spider a rune? Is the sound we hear our brain attempting to understand the rune as it is forced on us? Is this a reenactment of how Rom was ascended? Did that rune come from Kos? Maybe the Garden of Eyes were created with the same method but didn't ascend fully. Maybe Rom is a vacuous is vacuous because she was forced to ascend, and it broke her mind. So all very interesting, and uh, especially given the the deluge of questions there and uh, provocations at the end, uh, I'm obviously not going to be able to cover all of it. But something you said, uh, Brian, that really got the wheels turning in my mind was the notion that the great ones aren't able to understand us. And this brought to mind, uh, I believe it was a video, it might have just been, you know, something someone wrote, uh, and I want to say it was Neil deGrasse Tyson, uh, but it could also potentially have been, uh, I'm not sure, I'm going to go with Neil deGrasse Tyson, and I'll correct myself later if I'm wrong about that, but... Uh, something he said about, you know, if we were to ever come into contact with uh, intelligent extraterrestrial life, that there is a very, very real possibility that these, you know, beings would be incredibly hostile to us. And his reasoning, uh, and it's not necessarily reasoning I agree with, and maybe that's because I've always been uh, a Carl Sagan fanboy. Uh, the reasoning offered is simply that you know, if you're an alien, and if you are so, like, if an alien were to suddenly uh, slip space jump into our solar system, into the solar system, into our planetary system, um, it follows, it's almost necessarily true that they will be <laughs> so far advanced compared to us that they will look at us much in the same way that we look at ants. Sure, you know, you can study them, you can kind of put them in, you know, behind glass in an ant farm type thing and try to understand their motivations and stuff. But for, you know, the vast majority of us, and even then, you, you are taking them out of their natural environment, of their natural way of being by trying to study them. Uh, there is an active role played uh, by science when trying to understand the world. Uh, when you are doing an experiment, you're not experimenting on something as it exists in nature. You are, uh, by definition, controlling variables, taking that thing out of nature, and therefore changing the way it behaves. Uh, but that's kind of an aside. All of this is to say, basically, that from the Great One's perspective, they would look at us kind of like ants. That they'd be like, well, you know, you can, they can try to understand our motivations, but in the same way that ants can't understand our motivations, uh, we can't understand theirs. In other words, the great, we don't understand the great ones' goals and ambitions and uh, their modes of existence. 
and they look at us in the same way, but just in reverse. Uh, and that's, yeah, a very interesting way of putting it that uh, I'm very grateful to Brian for uh, bringing up. Again, dialogue, right? This is something that, like, that's not something that I would have just come up with on my own. So very cool, thank you. Next we have a comment from Aresh. Uh, who writes, the amygdala seem to have been in part inspired by lattice fungus, fused with a thuloid figure, and looking at it, Rom seems to have been similarly modeled after bleeding tooth fungus. There are lots of odd plants out there, actually. And looking at the image, in fact, actually, <laughs> I thought I had the image here with me, so I'll overlay it on the screen, but um, you will all have to uh, be the judges yourselves, because I very uh, absentmindedly forgot to include it in my notes here. Uh, but seems very interesting. I, I looked at it briefly before actually pulling up this comment and saving it to be able to talk about. Uh, but yeah, I don't. I'm not looking at it right now, so it's going to be up to each of you to judge. Uh, also, the blood liquors seem to have been inspired by Japanese spirits called Akanami. They are bloated humanoids that crawl on all fours and lick your bathroom clean with a long tongue. And uh, by way of an edit, Resh also added, Well, they definitely knew about the genus of fungus. There's a cut item that is a dried member of that family. So, uh, very perceptive then in that case uh, that you, you actually drew that connection. So thank you, Aresh. 12 is a letter, writes, uh, I think Joey H. was referring, to, and this is in response to my uh, discussion of Joey's comment from the previous episode. I think Joey H. was referring to one of the holdup NPCs near the Bigot and Ariana, the one who responds to the player's knock with, Praise you, praise the whole damn church. And Joey responded by saying, Thanks, yes, that is the NPC uh, I was referring to. I've always wondered what exactly has him in that state of mind, as he doesn't seem to be having uh, too bad of a time. A lot of the other NPCs seem to have gone completely crazy, while he is he just seems very inebriated. Um, and 12 is a letter also points out, so I'll just finish reading this before, uh, we, uh, before I respond to... Uh, the clarif clarification on Joey's comment. Uh, a note on Rom and Abritus. Although I believe that they are related in the sense that they are of the same species, I don't think the two are directly related. I think you find a Rom-like husk at the altar of despair because when Abritus was brought there from Is, Is, she was still in larval form and only later molted into the form we see her in. We find more ROMs and more Abritises in the Chalice Dungeons, so I don't see why we should connect the Moonside Lake ROM and the Altar of Despair ROM, when there is a precedent for of there being many more of their species. Uh, I don't know if I would count those as being precedents, because as we suggested, the Dreamlands could very well contain reflections of real-world people, things, and consciousnesses. So, I don't know if it's a precedent that there are many of them. It, it, the only precedent, I, it, from my perspective, that might set is, uh, like I just said, that there can be various reflections of individuals or people or things in the dreamlands. But uh, that also requires, that also is based on my assumption that the Chalice Dungeons are part of the dreamlands. But as for the NPC in the Cathedral Ward, uh, that is something that I talked about when we came into contact with that NPC, and I can't recall what episode it was in, but I do recall that we picked up right next to where that NPC was. There's, there's the door that's there, and then right across from that, there's a item, and you pick it up. It is the Black Church Hunter set. And I seem to recall myself claiming or arguing that that set was placed there for a very specific purpose. And that is in that the item description talks about how the 
the black shawl of the healing church strikes fear into the heart of Yarnamites. And so, in my view, the, the disposition of that NPC is supposed to be a be placed in direct juxtaposition to that item description. So you pick up the item description, then you talk to the NPC, and you say to yourself, oh, so that's how an average Yarnamite thinks in terms of, you know, the healing church. They are consumed by fear. That's my view of it anyway, but, uh, yeah, it is, it, there are certain NPCs behind the doors that it's kind of hard to figure out what their deal is. So you're a beach rights, and and this person left in several very interesting comments. Uh, but I'm in just looking at the time now. I'm realizing that I'm running very long. So I unfortunately won't be able to get to even all the comments that I thought I would be able to get to. But you're a beach rights. I forgot to mention the fluorescent flower. Its range attack begins as a call beyond, but it looks a bit like a supernova. And when it dies, it seems like a black hole is sucking up the flower portion of it. And this is very interesting because, of course, if, uh, as I understand it, if I recall correctly, when a supernova uh, occurs, first of all, the star needs to be large enough for a supernova to be possible. And if the star is large enough and uh, a supernova actually takes place, then yeah, a black hole will be found in its place. So, very interesting. I'm not sure whether that means anything, but it was just a really cool touch that I didn't notice, but I'm very grateful that Yura Beach did. Marcello writes, Great, uh, great collaboration between Aegon and Redgrave. That back and forth discussion really helps bring, bring up insightful interpretations of the lore. Uh, I must mention that the eye rune dropped by Willem is identical to Lovecraft's Elder Sign, as depicted by August Derleth. The sign is an eldritch symbol created by the Elder Things, a spacefaring race of bioengineers, uh, whom became stranded on prehistorical Earth, later succumbing to their own horrific creations. The, the Shogoths, mentioned in that China... Uh, Myville lecture linked in an earlier video in this series. It is said that the Elder Sign could ward off the Great Old Ones. Here's a wiki Wikipedia link. And uh, Marcel also mentioned, I should correct myself here, this sign was not created by the Elder Things, however. Uh, their less version of it seems to be designed after their likeness. They had starfish shaped heads, among other weird characteristics detailed in At the Mountains of Madness. And this one I did actually remember to include in my notes. And, yep, it looks virtually identical. And that's very interesting. So, again, just showing the enormous influence that uh, the Lovecraftian mythos, I guess, seems to have had on Miyazaki in crafting the story for this game. Uh, Brayden writes, I love this episode. You should guest a few more people. I loved having the discussion between you and Redgrave made it feel even more of a community talk. So, as I mentioned earlier on, that's something that I would love to do and that I'm not precluding the possibility of doing in the future. Uh, but for right now, beyond having Redgrave on uh, a couple more times, uh, I'm, you know, I can't promise anything. So I'll just say that. Uh, but on the name of the Garden of Eyes, if you think about it, gardens are used for farming of sorts, and Bergenworth is quite literally filled to the brim with eyes. I think it's quite possible that Willem used the Garden of Eyes to collect eyes to line his brain with. Also, if you think about Bergenworth, is already kind of mixed into the Dreamlands because the lecture hall of Bergenworth is in the Dreamlands. There's something funky going on with Bergenworth and... Uh, again, with this line that separates the waking world from the dreamlands. And as I've suggested in weeks past, it just doesn't seem to be that there's all that clear a separation between the two. Uh, it seems much more fuzzy than you might otherwise expect it to be. Uh, and finally, we have a comment from Jarlix, uh, who writes, uh, quote, I had a bit of a theory concerning the moon presence's motivations. 
People think it's out to assassinate the other great ones for a Lovecraftian goal beyond our comprehension, but I fell upon the idea that maybe it puts people through the slang of other great ones to find a worthy candidate it can ascend, like in the best ending. Much like how you link the fire in Dark Souls, but sacrifice yourself as one of many potential undead. This would mean that it trapped Garman for the express purpose of shepherding hunters that can meet this requirement, which itself may have something to do with the umbilical cords. What do you think? That entanglements and relationships between the Great Ones are indeed shady and may or may not be discovered with more thought put into them, but the Moon Presence's objective at least may just be this, whatever it spells for his contemporaries. It would also explain why Garman was picked, not because the Moon Presence sympathized with his plight, but because he was a lost cause fit for the job and got taken for the Presence's use in a moment of vulnerability. And so this is very interesting for several reasons, um, but I do like how it, yeah, uh, how you use Dark Souls, you know, the moon, the moon presence as sort of a a great one version of Lord Gwyn, and yeah, I like this idea. I think it's very interesting, um, especially given the the motivation for the whole idea behind the Great Ones and their children, uh, which we won't talk about today because we're out of time, but we will talk about um, in a future episode. And that is the idea that uh, the Great Ones are kind of like the very elite members of society and that, you know, they're less likely to have children and that therefore children are kind of more precious to them. And that would seem also to be linked to the idea of a legacy. And so I could see this theory being true insofar as the moon presence, uh, if indeed there can be any mortality for a great one, that maybe the moon presence needs a, needs a child to carry on its legacy. So in that sense, maybe, but that could also, you know, contradict with the notion that, um, with the notion that we really can't understand the motivations of the Great Ones, because once again, the whole idea of, you know, having a child to carry on your legacy is a very human idea. Uh, it's a very worldly, or not necessarily provincial idea, but it is tied into, you know, the motivation from Miyazaki's perspective of the preciousness of children for the great ones because they like you know I guess the most educated people in society are less likely to have children and that therefore you know their children are in many ways more more treasured by their parents than maybe are uh, the children of someone who had 10 children or something and you know it falls from there that if you only have one child and if, as a person who is very successful and well-known, you only have the one child, people will, and to some degree, be looking to that child to carry on whatever it is that you're known for. So in that sense, maybe. Maybe the Moon Presence locked Garmin here as a way, as part of that. As this, you know, setting up these trials uh, that would eventually, potentially, lead uh, to them having a child to carry on its legacy. So, I don't know, maybe, but it's very interesting. Again, sincerest apologize, uh, sincerest apologize, sincerest apologies for not getting to more comments because there were several more that I wanted to discuss, uh, but I just, we just don't have the time. Uh, but thank you very much for joining me, and I will see you next time. Bye-bye.